What's up, what's up? It is your boy, RC Apologist, here with another episode and edition of the Vantillion Thinker Podcast. Well, it's going to be an interesting time, and especially trying to catch up with all of y'all here. Uh, let me see here. Make sure to lower the volume a little bit in the music. So, y'all are probably wondering where I have been. I'm going to still let the music be playing a bit while I explain. Well, you see. I had mentioned that I had come down with bronchitis, but then eventually found out I tested positive for COVID. So, needed a break, not just in terms of the bronchitis, but also a bit of the COVID. Quickly, symptoms started to get better after the whole deal with that. But, I'm back, and going to try to be putting out content. I needed a bit of a break, as well as for personal reflection and examination uh, regarding my faith in Christ, and trying to get that whole thing it is a small walk and it is a journey that will continue to be the case all right that being said we are now going to be coming back with a new episode and again usual episodes will be here and there at this point uh, but i do have the usual tea and water to help me with this point that being said so we're going to go into the topic of what i found to be an interesting deal And what eventually has now led me to being, while being reformed in thought. So, you know, I do affirm the five points of Calvinism in terms of at least the general thought um, and other particular elements. The one thing that I am at heart, though, is in the sense a Puritan, in the sense that I am one who does not try to adhere to certain elements within tradition and I do want to try to go back to the purity of the faith and with that being said the one thing that I found to be a problem with some not all but some in the um, reformed church specifically of those who adhere to the confessions is that ultimately we're seeing an issue where we are going to say that we are reformed that we are trying our best to promote the biblical doctrines of grace to promote what the bible teaches to promote sola scriptura to promote the same time sola fide the justification of faith apart from works the notion we teach on that is now at this point being conflicted against with the idea of some who adhere to a strong favoritism towards some of the particular confessions. Now, I used to be in terms of a confession, Southern Baptist. I was the person adhering to the Baptist faith and message. Eventually got out of that whole deal and went full on to being just simply trying to say, well, you know, I'm maybe Reformed Baptist, you know? So that would be there, but then eventually got to being Westminster Confession, therefore Presbyterian. However... There was a problem that I then began to see once I was around the Presbyterian deal. Now, there are several people that I've come across that did not encounter this particular deal. For example, a co-host that was on one of the old podcasts, he's probably one of the big influences that had gotten me to become a Presbyterian on the full run, along with a port, of course, Scripture being the ultimate source of that and binding of the conscience, is the fact of the black doctor the black doctor was usually the guy that helped me out with becoming and going to that leaning into the confession of being presbyterian by the sense of the name and to a high degree i still adhere to a good bit of presbyterian uh, theology however reason i decided to now become what i'm calling reformed yet non-denominational is because of this I'm adhering to doctrine, but when I started making statements regarding the issue of saying that I'm against the idea of what is just called the traditional covenant theology position, that is, that says that, you know, there's the moral law and the ceremonial law, you know, this theonomy kind of stuff as well that goes along with some of these claims and some of these notions, a big idea that was a especially promoted by Greg Bonson during his time. My issue, however, starts with the idea that you will not find this idea when we're trying to talk about moral law and ceremonial law in the division. 
You will not find this concept um, in the Bible regarding the dividing of the law between the lesser laws and the greater laws or moral laws and ceremonial laws. This is a thing that, believe it or not, is what always then frustrates me because what I find at this point is that it is eventually just the realization that they are then going for a Roman Catholic import of how then we understand scripture and a Roman Catholic understanding of how we then divide up the law because the main div source of origin for this was in the works of Thomas Aquinas when he started to utilize the moral law and the ceremonial law and all that kind of stuff in the terms of dividing it there. And even then, we cannot agree what is a moral law, what is a ceremonial law, and all that kind of stuff. When the fact of the matter is, the reality is that all of the law is a moral law. Everything from the sacrifices to these certain issues about dietary laws, all these things were considered moral laws because if you break the law of God, you violate the law of God, you are a sinner against God, and you are standing to be condemned at that point in light of what the law teaches. So there is no excuse by the Reformed community to try to suggest that this is not connected to that because of the fact is that we don't see this division within not just simply the Bible. We don't even see it within even the early stages within Christianity. It comes much later once the Roman Catholic theologians and, ph and philosophers started to try to divide it up. And then some people later on decided to adopt this particular practice. And hence why this is was even one of the things that I've noticed with Keith Thompson of Exegetical Apologetics Ministries, um, that on his blog post he had stated that he adhered to the Reformed Baptist Confession, the 1689 uh, London Baptist Confession of Faith, but he disagreed with a couple of the elements of it by pointing out that he affirmed New Covenant theology, which is the position that I adhere to after reading the Bible a bit more, and as well as looking at one book from Charles Leader, uh, called The Law of Christ. If no one has read that book, I would highly recommend you to get that. It is even available for free as a PDF file that you can find. Just simply look up The Law of Christ by Charles Leader. It is a very good one. Um, but yeah, you don't find anywhere within the scriptures about this notion that we have uh, this divided law. But because of what the confession states then about this division about the law, moral law and ceremonial law, that's what goes. And that's ultimately what we're seeing is then at that point, Scripture is no longer going to be the ultimate authority in this regard, but rather the issue of the appeal to feelings, the appeal to emotion, and the appeal to some people, the appeal to ultimately simply the tradition. Now, the issue that I would point out is where we have the issue on then the point we are supposed to be based on God's word for the issue of the binding of the conscience. In fact, in the book What is Reformed Theology by R.C. Sproul, Understanding of the Basics, we see in page 50 that the following regarding sola scriptura, the principle that we are supposed to adhere to as Protestants. This slogan declared the idea that only the Bible has the authority to bind the consciences of believers, uh, Protestants, did recognize other forms of authority, so keep in mind, Protestants did recognize other forms of authority, such as the church offices, civil magistrates, and church creeds and confessions. Now, again, I can understand, and I did, and I still do understand, the need and the usage for some particular creed or confession in order to allow the statements of some things to be made. But, however... It says, but they saw, this is still on page 50, but they saw these authorities as being derived from and subordinate to the authority of God. So these are authorities that are to be submitted. They are below a higher authority and that there is an ultimate authority above even confessions and creeds. And I want you to listen to this next part here. None of these lesser authorities were deemed absolute because all of them were capable of error, including the Westminster Confession, including the London Baptist Confession, including any creed or confession that is devised by the hands and the minds and the works of men. 
all simply fallible. And hence, why we should test all these things. In fact, it goes on to say, God alone is infallible. Fallible authorities cannot bind the conscience absolutely. That right is reserved to God and his word alone, to scripture alone. And in fact, even this note is within the Westminster Confession of Faith, within chapter 1. And I try to point this out to some people, that this is where we go to then regarding the authority of scripture. But no, 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 no. We don't disagree with anything. Don't you dare disagree with anything in the Westminster Confession. Don't you dare find a flaw or a point of contention within the London Baptist Confession of Faith. No, 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 no. But here it is in Westminster Confession of Faith, also found in the London Baptist Confession of Faith, Chapter 1, Section 10. The supreme judge by which all controversies of religion to be determined and all decrees of counsel, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits are to be examined, and whose sentence we are to rest, can be no other but the Holy Spirit speaking within the scriptures. Now, to go into some of the issues regarding what the Bible states, let's go, for those that are watching on the deal there, and can at least watch there, if you're listening on a uh, podcast format, or if you're watch, listening to this in the car, uh, don't worry about it. We'll get to it. But I'll read in Matthew chapter 22, verse 29, we read that Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do error, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Now, why am I just quoting this particular scripture? Well, I'm quoting the scriptures that are used in the text, in the proof text of the support of this particular passage. And it says that he's answering them regarding a particular issue that they error because they don't know the scriptures and nor do they know the power of God. But if you go to then verse 31, the next part, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, and then what do you know? There's the quotation, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So we have here the notion about God with the scriptures being the ultimate authority and even quoting the scriptures to give the example. So, if scripture is the ultimate authority, we go there. We appeal to that. Now, go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Another one of the proof texts that is utilized here. And what do we get? We'll start at verse 19 so we can get the now. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So, we have being built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ being the cornerstone. How do we know about Christ? How do we come to this conclusion about this? Is the issue about the scriptures. And again, then we go to the Acts. Acts chapter 28, verse 25. The last chapter of the book of Acts, where it mentions, starting in verse 24, some believe the things which were spoken and some believe not. So some believe some of the things that were spoken and taught by the apostles and the prophets. Others did not. Well, what happens in verse 25? And when they agreed not among themselves, so when there was no agreement upon themselves regarding the particular issue, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, the prophet, unto our father. So, and then you can see within the bold letters that are then here, then the ultimate issue is that, okay, there's division, there's the departure then that happens. And Paul then speaking the one word, speaking the Holy Ghost via the inspiration of the prophet, unto the fathers and so that's the issue that's ultimately the settle of the case is what did one of the one of the prophets say regarding what was revealed in scripture <sighs> again that should be the issue that should be where our point goes and that should be what our focus is is on the basis of what scripture states and in fact in this particular copy of the Westminster Confession, a note from Pastor Lim. Uh, the name is J.J. Lim, for the author, those who are interested and curious into getting this particular notion. 
in one of the notes on page 14 regarding the notes of this particular statement of the confession, it states the following. It is by way of the scripture that the Holy Spirit exercises his role as the supreme or ultimate judge to settle all controversies of religion, to determine the soundness of the opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits. Further on we see, we must rest upon his sentence as final. Therefore, the scripture is our final authority and appeal in all areas of doctrine and Christian life. Our Lord, who himself is the living word of God, in his controversies with Satan and the Jews. So, and then we point out here about human authorities, whether church fathers, popes, bishops, or pastors, and human experiences must be judged against the scriptures. Creeds and confessions are authoritative only in so far as they are loyal to the scripture. We therefore speak of our confession of faith and catechisms as the subordinate standards of the church. The scripture is the standard. We hold our subordinate standards in high regard only because we are persuaded that it is a faithful interpretation and exposition of the scripture which was put together by the collective wisdoms of our fathers of the faith under the providential guidance and illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. And so, again, we have this notion here. But Akaris, keep reading, for the reason when our private interpretation of a passage or verse of scripture differs from the confessional interpretation, we must never assume that the confession is wrong unless we are fully persuaded that our interpretation is correct after careful and exhaustive study with the corroboration of other learned and pious believers. We must give precedence to interpretation of the confession as the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking in the scripture. However, keep in mind, again, they are subordinate standards. And as it says here, and since it is the case, quote, we should appeal to the scripture rather than our creeds and confessions when disputing with those who do not subscribe to the same confession and who may differ from us on particular doctrines. Now, I would go to a step further and would state that we should appeal to these issues about scripture. We should appeal to scripture without having to distinguish between if we're talking to one of the same confession or of the same denomination or any of these sorts. We should appeal to Scripture on simply the basis of that and not have to think, okay, if this person is part of the Reformed Baptist uh, or the Westminster uh, Confession, then we use that as the deal. We do not go to this. We do not go to uh, Scripture. We deal with this first. We go to Scripture. That's the ultimate authority. Treat it like it. But furthermore... And since this is called the Vandillian Thinker, let's go to how Van Til is even pointed something out that, again, some people are not being as bold about. And that is that we go to the issue here regarding Scripture. Now, this is in Christian Apologetics, the second edition. And we're going to find, let me see if I can find the particular quote real quick here. Okay. Protestants are required, by the most basic principles of their system, to vindicate the existence of no other God than the one who has spoken in the scripture. So, that being said, we have the issue that Protestants, we are to prove specifically the God that is within the notion of scripture. And even Van Til points out, especially with the issue about the method that is used, as is discussed in chapter 4 in Christian Apologetics, the problem of method, that that's the main issue, is that people have forsaken the usage of the scripture as ultimate authority, as opposed to what he refers to as the Romanist, who decides to utilize nothing more than just simply appealing to the traditions of men, and the confessions and the catechisms as ultimate authority. And that, again, is where there is the problem that occurs. Because then when you're trying to make these disputes, you go back, well, you know, this is what we state in our confession. And it's okay, again, to point out what you believe according to what is within the confession. But again, that is the support of an authority. And a lot of these people that are liking to call themselves reform these days. And again, part of the reason why I do not like the status of where the church had been regarding these issues is that they would appeal to traditional writers. They would appeal 
to some of these individuals. And they would appeal to them in the sense that almost as if Scripture was on the equal level with them. That the authors of the Westminster Confession, the London Baptist Confession, the Baptist Faith and Message, all these particular things were on the same level. But they're not. At all. Scripture is the ultimate authority. So yeah, you could say, well, the Westminster says this. And yeah, you say you're a Westminster Confession type of guy. You're a Presbyterian. But why don't you agree with this particular part? Because according to what I have seen within Scripture, Scripture is what ultimately binds my consciousness on this matter. When I see the Scriptures and when I observe and read it, that's what I'm getting at. I do not need to adhere to a particular part of the confession if I am disagreeing with it. And if you're going to say that I'm not reformed somehow for that reason, or that I'm being a hypocrite for that reason, my friend, you need to then really evaluate your own self. Because I'm not going to name names, of course, of regarding who one of these particular people. It was a couple individuals that I've had this conversation with, and I wish well for them, I pray for them, I hope everything goes well for them. But... It is becoming to the point where we're starting to not even grasp or understand the basic concepts or the basic elements of what it means to be a Christian anymore because we're deciding to get lost within the notions of tradition instead of trying to get involved with the notion and the concept and the precepts about being Christian within the sense of Scripture. We are to appeal to God as our Lord. God is Lord. He is our Lord, our ruler, and we submit to him and his and His authority, and therefore we submit to the word of God. But however, when differences of belief occur, and these differences of belief are based upon not emotional pleas, these differences of belief are not based upon the issues of you know, certain realms of philosophical tendencies that are centered and styled after men, but rather that these are differences of belief that are based upon the simple persuasiveness and binding of the conscience of Scripture, then we shouldn't just simply try to throw accusations of doubting if one is a Christian, doubting if one is really reformed, doubting those kinds of things. Like I know one person who was given that kind of treatment uh, very harshly by several of these similar kinds of people. And though not again, I repeat myself, not every reformed person is like this. Because other people in the reformed community knew of this individual and were willing to communicate and have him on and be at certain areas. But it was the issue about... Um, the brother Chris Date, a uh, very good, very wise brother in Christ. Um, but the main contention that he has had, and I don't know if there's others. Again, I only know of one particular one that a lot of people like to give him some flack for. Is the notion that he affirms the doctrine of annihilationism when it comes to hell. Now, I would disagree with him on this. And I would think I would have biblical and scholarly uh, reasons regarding what some of the scholars have pointed out, especially in uh, one of the books I had gotten a while back on the topic. But when it comes to this particular issue about annihilationism and you know eternal torment in the traditional kind of view, not eternal fire, of course, I'm talking about from my particular view, from what I've understood, is from simply the pure darkness that then is pointed out there. But with that, the idea that we have to alienate Chris, do we have to alienate Brother Chris away because he differs on this particular thing? And again, there are people out there that are like that. That we got to push him away or push them because, well, where do you find annihilationism in the, in the traditional uh, creeds or the confessions that we teach as Reformed people? Uh, brother, if you're going to have a contention with him, why don't you go to the scriptures? The moment they start trying to appeal mostly to the issue about what does then the confession say, as usually the first thing when they're talking with someone that is of reformed, 
This should be a red flag. It honestly should be a red flag. Because the point is not about what does the confession say. The point should be about what does scripture say? What does the Bible say? Put your confession down for a minute. Put your catechism down for a minute. Tell me what the Bible says. Don't go to the, don't go there. Don't go to the issue about the catechism of the confessions. Go to the scriptures. And if you tell me to not and that we need to go to the confessions as reformed people, then I'm sorry, we have nothing more to say. Because again, the issue about ultimate authority is what should be very important, especially if not one is just simply reformed, but especially if one does adhere to as it is implied on the show, as well as it being someone who adheres to presuppositional apologetics, being a Vantillian. If you're going to be that, the main point of the method of that apologetic is adhering, or is adhering to the sufficiency and the ultimate authority of Scripture. But, unfortunately, we are reaching a point where even that is not being considered by people. It's, oh, well, you know, what does the confession say? That's what we really need to focus on. <sighs> but, well, you can't win them all. You can't win them all. So, my point of con my last point, and this is what I'll leave y'all off with for some food of thought, is simple. Think about whenever you're in a discussion with someone, if you're trying to reach out to the lost souls... What do you do? Do you go into the confession to try to defend your faith? Or do you go to the scriptures? So in the same way, when it comes to the matter of handling disputes between fellow brothers in Christ, do not exceed the scriptures. For even the Bible states, and I'll quickly pull this up, because this is one of my favorite deals here, and I'll pull it from the uh, CH, HCSB, but I also prefer the CSB regarding this, because this is very accurate translation of this particular deal here. Verse 9. Anyone who does not remain, this is in Second John, anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching but goes beyond it does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. So I want y'all to really think about that and may God bless y'all and may y'all be edified. Till then, this has been RC Apologist. Take care. It's good to be back.